Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Ryan. I play chess and put my videos on YouTube here. Uh, today I've got a great example of uh, the Grand Prix, which is my new favorite system against the Sicilian defense. Um, and uh, just basically really solid game from both sides. This guy is a 1580 player, which is probably one of the top 10 highest rated players I've ever won against. Um, and uh, let's go through it um, here on the analysis board. And so I played E4. And I set up for the Grand Prix, which is my favorite system against uh, Sicilian here. Um, and it goes with immediately gaining pressure on the king side here. Um, this pawn here is blocking in a lot of uh, development, and it's threatening to, um, you know, push this pawn here and win the center. Um, he develops his knight, which helps me, um, which helps him clamp down on the square. Now I develop this knight, trying to fight for it. I develop my bishop to the f pawn here, um, and uh, you'll notice that his dark square bishop is locked in here on the Sicilian, and uh, I like that a lot because it allows me to develop. Uh, more quickly than him because I can just castle now, whereas he's got to move a pawn, move this bishop, and then castle. Um, my king side is all ready to go, and uh, so he he uh, tries to get this bishop out and ca castles. Usually in the Grand Prix, you'll see that he, they fee and shuttle this bishop, but he didn't in this game. Um, that's another advantage of the Grand Prix system against the Sicilian is, is that you know not a lot of players play it. Uh, so immediately you'll catch your opponent a little bit off guard if he usually likes to play with the Sicilian. So I connect my pawn chain here in the center, uh, solidify everything down, open up a window for my bishop now. And uh, he begins to set up an attack on my bishop, which I don't like, and I don't want him to gain that much space here on the queen side. So I play this um, uh, prophylactic uh, a4 move, and he drops his knight in there. It's not a bad place for the knight, it's not a great place for the knight. Um, if you notice, all my pieces are starting to warm up and line up with this king, so I'm not so worried about playing on the queen side. Uh, you should always kind of attack where your pawns are facing, and that's what he's doing though, so I don't think it's a terrible move. Um, my pawns are pointing this way, and his pawns are beginning to point this way. So. Let's see how the next few moves go. I castle, and he brings this pawn down. He now has, um, you know, he's able to do that now. I can't just recapture. So instead of just giving up the center, um, I don't want to just capture here. I drop my bishop back, um, and then I retake, and he decides, and I agree that he should just trade queens off. So we reach this semi-equal position. I've got a slight material and developmental advantage. Um, I push this pawn here forces his knight to move. I don't want to trade anything off yet because I'm more developed, and I believe that, you know, if you're more developed than your opponent, then your pieces are worth more. So, I begin to, also another thing about this move is that it's moving a piece over here on the king side. Um, more pieces against your king will allow you to have more attacking chances. I'm also attacking this pawn now. He develops another minor piece, and I decide to kick this knight, the only thing defending this pawn here. So, I win my first pawn, and he threatens my rook. I just simply drop it back, and he pressures it again. Um, I drop my rook back again, and he castles queen side. It's a ballsy move since his king is very open. Uh, I develop this knight over here, trying to start something, win a bishop, um, and he goes ahead and takes it. And then he moves this light square bishop out of the way. Now, his dark square bishop is much more important to him than his light square bishop, simply because, you know, he's got a check here. My king is on a dark square, and so his dark square bishop, for example, if this guy ever moves, he can come here and pin my rook. But he trades it off, and now I want to continue to develop. I want to develop my last bishop into the game and get things rolling with him over here. Um, so that's why I dropped my um, rook back. I didn't have a great move in this position. Um, I knew full well that he's probably going to kick my knight, but he, he goes ahead and trades off his last bishop, which I don't know is, if it's, it's his best move. He develops his knight, and I develop this bishop, and I think this is a good game to exemplify why bishops are better than knights often in the endgame, um, and we'll see why very shortly. So he brings his rook down, attacking my bishop, getting him to a very active square. This is a very good move from him, um, and I go ahead and threaten to take that knight. He goes ahead with his knight here and threatens my rook, but this allows me to win a pawn. So this is the second pawn that I've won. So this is the second pawn that I've won, and it's becoming very apparent that these pawns are going to decide the game. Uh, if you notice, you know, my pawns are all in very um, active positions, I guess, and his pawns, you know, it's starting to become a factor. I've got a passed pawn that I can potentially march up the board. Uh, these pawns are very advanced. Um, anyway, so he has to move his king, and it's at this point that I had a tough time deciding where I wanted to go with this uh, rook. For example, I can't go here um, because of this fork. He would win a rook in that variation. I can't go here because he's attacking it. I can't go here. So I ended up moving all the way over here. And it's at this point that uh, it's going to become apparent that my uh, bishop is going to be dominant against this guy's knight. 
And I like this position a lot is because this pawn chain is strong. Everything is strong together. I've got a nice center and he threatens this. This is, there's no threat here. And I simply attack this knight. He resigned at this point because it's apparent that uh, I'm going to have a very comfortable end game, especially because now I've got, depending on what he does next, if he moves this knight anywhere, I've got a really nice discovered check on the king, I guess. I can check him here. If he takes back, I've got my rook will take right here. If he moves his king here um, and defends this rook, then I'm going to be A-OK -okay and just take this rook anyways, and uh, his knight is going to be stranded you know, somewhere over here with not much to do. And my bishop is going to become very active, and uh, that's the importance of having an open endgame when you have a bishop. I appreciate you guys for watching. I wish you the best of luck in your chess. Bye-bye. What's up, guys? Thanks again for watching my video here today. I really appreciate it. And uh, if you have any questions about any specific moves or anything about the game, please leave them below. I'd love to answer those. Um, and last but not least, if you got anything out of this video at all or you just simply enjoyed it, I would highly encourage you to subscribe. Uh, it helps me out a lot, and uh, that way you can you know, get in touch with any future videos that I put out. Anyways, have a good rest of your day, and good luck in your chess.